Hey, Better Together with Maria Menounos fans. Hey, Hill Squad. It's me, Mr. Maria Menounos. <laughs> Kevin Undergaro. You can't steal my line. It's me, Kelsey. Oh, we need to produce that show. I keep saying it's me, uh, Kelsey. I want to do traffic. I'm ready. And I, I thought think you were doing weather. I'm going to do weather. Yes, we need to find a traffic person for it's me, Kelsey. Anyway, <laughs> today, you guys, a little treat uh, and something I think very timely. And, you know, we kind of trust the universe on this show. And s- some of our guests were referencing constantly Marianne Williamson. Yeah. And uh, we realized it might be an opportune moment to replay this episode Universe speaking to us, and maybe now it'll speak to you. Mm-hmm. By seeing this episode, Kelsey, what are some of the things that uh, we can expect to hear? This was done actually with uh, Maria. It was in Los Angeles. No, or actually, you guys. So this was East a, Coast this was a fun one. This is when Maria and I had gone to Florida um, for a Tony Robbins event. Okay, and so Maria is filming this like from the floor of this friend's house we're staying at, like on the laptop. Yeah, it's pretty good. So you'll be like, where is she? So she's in Florida, um, 2020 for a Tony event, the UPW she spoke at. But my God, Marianne is amazing. And I'm actually going to listen again, too, because it was, yeah, Ryan Weiss kept mentioning her. And I said to Kev, and I even said it to you guys in our outro, I was like, y'all should re-listen to this. And I'm like, you know what? No, we're going to give it to them so they do re-listen to it, make it easier. And I'm going to re-listen to it because she's a very powerful um, incredible woman, and I'm. If you missed it, what are some? It, of, you know, what are some of the things that you remember? You got that you went over. You don't know. I didn't mean to put you on. The I don't spot. know. Okay, I don't here's remember. my. But here's my takeaway. Okay, I have a different takeaway. I'm like my face is like no. no, no well, re-listen. well, listen. This may be the one thing the universe gave us with this is the fact that you just described Maria on a laptop on the floor, and I think of the headspace she was in this summer. I had mom and dad safe without COVID in LA. I yeah. was doing all the renovations. She was able to quiet things yeah. down for the first time in 20 years around her. It was just you two. Yeah. And still had a lot of responsibility to go down and host for Tony. But uh, the f- right now, Maria wouldn't be able to do that. No, I you're couldn't right. see Maria on the floor with a laptop. A I think she just, the anxieties, everything would start coming apart on her you're so right because even when i think back to it it was kind of crazy because i was like upstairs having to then turn off my camera run downstairs give her like cues and it was like chill and we did it for a couple days like that no and then we were think just thinking whenever we did the tim story interview at the dunkin donuts parking lot in the prius so fun on my birthday on your birthday (laughs) and we were thinking to ourselves like you know this would be marie would really it would be overwhelming for her yeah but not this summer, so that's interesting. Yeah. That's good to know. So mm-hmm. anyway, without further ado, we bring you our um, repeat presentation of Maria Menounos' interview with Marianne Williamson. Enjoy. So Marianne. Marianne, as I said, is a best-selling author, political activist, spiritual thought leader. For over three decades, she's been a leader in spiritual and religious progressive circles, She's the author of 14 books, four of which have been New York Times number one bestsellers. She founded Project Angel Food, which is a nonprofit that's delivered more than 12 million meals to ill and dying homebound patients since 1989. And in these dark times, she is here to help us move from anxiety to enlightenment. Marianne, thanks so much for being back with us. Oh, thank you, Maria. It's always lovely to see you. Thank you for having me. Of course. So... You know, anxiety to enlightenment. It's funny. Before I left to come here to Florida uh, last week, my husband said, he's like, Maria, you need to figure out the cure for anxiety, especially for women. And it sounds like you might have it. So maybe this is the form it's coming in. Well, first of all, I think we want to unpack a little bit about what anxiety is. You know, we have developed over the last few years in this country an aversion to being sad Mm -hmm. and it does not serve us i remember when my daughter was a small child and she would come home from school and she was very disappointed or she was sad or she was angry and upset and i realized that the point of being a mother of a small child is to help them deal with difficult emotions because later in life they would have to deal with them to help her develop the emotional musculature not to create situations where she could always avoid those emotions because they're part of life. Sometimes we're sad because events are sad. 
And the appropriate emotion to have when an event is sad is sadness. Now, the fact that so many Americans are very anxious right now, federal troops are about to invade Chicago. If you're not anxious about this, who are you? If it, when you look at whether it is COVID, whether it is the fact that so many millions of Americans are going to be evicted very shortly, so many Americans really don't know how they're going to feed their children, whether it's how many Americans are dealing with the disease already, or whether it's how many Americans are very upset about what's going on politically, what kind of human being would not be anxious right now? You'd have to be a sociopath, actually, to have no human feeling and empathy for what's happening. The cure for anxiety is to solve the problems that cause the anxiety. We have a tendency to think all anxiety is free-floating. And I think particularly for American women right now, no, we're not, we're not like weak and we have this mental problem and it's this free-floating anxiety, which some would have us believe. And they've made billions of dollars off that belief that there's something wrong with us. There's nothing wrong with us. We're anxious because we know that something's wrong. We feel it. We feel it. And the fact that we feel it is based on millions of years of evolutionary thinking. Our psychic pain is really no different than our physical pain. If, if you put your hand in super hot water and you were burned, the fact that your brain registers pain is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. The problem is when people don't register pain and then they could really, really hurt themselves. Psychic pain is the same. We don't understand. Psychic pain is there for a reason. You know, I know traditional, some old traditional Christian ladies that I knew in Detroit, and they used to say, I felt a disturbance in my heart. I felt a disturbance in my heart. Yeah, that's, that's what, the, before we had terms like anxiety, People saw it was conscience, it was remorse, it was a sense. And women have a, an exquisitely finely tuned uh, sense. We can feel when something's wrong. You know, mm -hmm. I used to, when my daughter was little, I used to travel a lot. And I had hired a woman to uh, take care of things when I was gone. Well, I'll tell you what this woman was doing. My daughter was introducing drugs. I mean, this woman was introducing drugs. This woman was really terrible things. I would walk into my house when I would come home. Everything looked the same. Something in me knew something is wrong here. And finally, everything was fine. Everything was fine. But it took longer to dismantle all that than it should have if I just listened to my gut. Mm -hmm. We used to call it mothers. We used to call it a woman's intuition, and now we we poo poo all that. Yeah, and we call it something that's wrong, and particularly with women, it's not what's wrong; it's what's right. I love that you're saying that because it's interesting. I spent you know the last couple of days trying to teach people at the seminar to listen to their gut for their health, yes. Yes. but for everything, right? And I had a mystic on my show not long ago, her name is Deirdre Hayde. And she said, stop telling people you're crazy. Because a lot of us, especially as women, will preface things with, I know you're going to think I'm crazy, yeah, but... That's exactly right. That like, is you're exactly wise. Right. Pardon? She was like, you're wise. You're not Absolutely. crazy. Absolutely. Thank you. And we really need to push back. And we really need to wake up and grow up and recognize how many millions of dollars have been made by big pharmaceutical and others by con turning our, our upset into a profit center. Wow. Yeah, you're Thank right. You. you know, it's, um, it's almost like, you know, uh, stress is really the code word for fear. Like anxiety, do you think anxiety is really just a code word for like our intuition? Well, I don't think it's quite that simple. And I think yeah. there is such a thing as free floating anxiety. Don't get me wrong. But I believe we need to take a much more holistic look at everything that's happening. Not all upset, not all sadness, not all stress should be viewed as a problem. It's like I said, it's like when your body has a fever. Yeah, there's a functional aspect to fever. There's a functional aspect to pain and there's a functional aspect to psychic pain. 
But I also believe that we have a psychic immune system, an emotional and psychological immune system, just like we have a physical immune system. But you have to aid the immune system by addressing what is wrong. And so much in our, if, if you're living in America today in the midst of everything that's happening and not feeling some sadness, some deep concern, some anxiety, and, and, and then, then that's what's wrong. That's mm -hmm. what's wrong is how much bred complacency we gave giving people we gave people more permission, particularly American women. We gave people more permission to suppress their pain. And by giving people permission to desensitize themselves or suppress their pain, what we ended up doing was giving people permission to be complacent. Mm. And so many people in our society today. You know, I have a nice house behind me. You have a nice house behind me. There are many behind you. There are many people in this society who have been privileged enough to be able to buffer ourselves from certain of the more serious problems in our society. So our, our distraction and chronic disengagement from real political and social and economic problem solving became a luxury. Mm. And I think what's happening now is an awakening that we're all Americans and some of the personal upset that we're feeling is a microcosm. You know, I'm all pro therapy, but there are some real flaws in the ointment that has happened over the last several decades because of how many of us would go to therapy and be asked by the therapist What's wrong in your life that's causing you your despair or your upset without taking a look at how much our despair and upset was caused by the same conditions that millions of other people were experiencing? An example would be how many women, because in the United States we have not had paid uh, maternity and paternity leave, how many women have gone to a therapist and said, my problem is that I had to leave my baby after giving birth sooner than my every cell in my body knew it was time. So they would treat that as the woman's depression rather than treating it too often as a recognition that collectively we should have paid maternity leave. Wow. Yeah. You know, our, our bodies are giving us signals. Thank you built up over millions of years of evolution. The fact that you walk into a system, I mean, there is such a thing as healthy fear. The fact when you walk into a room and you know something's wrong, mm -hmm. and you know a common, uh, common characteristic of every advanced mammalian species that survives and thrives is the fierce behavior of the adult female of the species when she senses a threat to her cubs. That's why when you go hiking, they say the black bears won't bother you. Just stay away from their babies. Yeah. You. you see it in the lions. You see it in the tigers. Do you see this in, in all mammalian species? And our children are at risk in certain ways. You know, you mm -hmm. said you're in Florida. Right now, there's a huge struggle going on. The governor has said he wants to reopen the schools. Your teachers yeah. are pursuing the governor because many people feel it's too soon to open the schools. We don't, we're not spending the money for safety measures. The answer is not to, to uh, disengage from the great struggles of our time, particularly when it comes to the protecting of our children. And protection of our children at this time has got to mean just not, our, not just our own children, but every mother's child. I'm also really intrigued and, and happy to hear you say that if we are sad and feeling things right now, that we're not crazy. Because I found myself being profoundly overwhelmed with sadness and fear and confusion and hopelessness. Like I'm, I'm finding myself feeling hopeless of where this is all going and how long it's going to take to rectify things and... Um, and just the, just the state of affairs being really scary. Um, and so it makes me feel better to hear you say that because I have looked around and I'm like, is anyone else feeling this? And, and, and it's almost like, I don't feel like there are a lot of people feeling this or, or they don't want to feel it. 
Exactly. And that's like what you've talked about in your book is like numbing ourselves to things isn't good. Exactly. And also the old moniker, she's a hysterical woman. She's being over emotional. When the truth of the matter, all of the things that you described yourself as feeling right now is natural, is normal, and it's actually positive because it means you're looking at what's happening in this country. Yeah. You're looking at what's happening. The problem, you know, so many of the things that are happening now, Maria, they've been accumulating for 40 years. And they accumulated because too many of us were not looking for t- too often and for too long. It's like if someone tells you, gives you a cancer diagnosis, if someone gives you a, di- a cancer diagnosis about someone in your family, one of the things I've known uh, working with so many people up close and personal for 35 years who, who are going through serious problems is that when there is a serious problem, you know, there's a saying that every problem comes bear, bearing its own solution. What happens and what is happening to you with what you're describing is that when you hear really bad news, whole layers of ultimately unimportant preoccupations begin to fall away. But it's a process. It's like when uh, Elizabeth Kubler Ross would talk about the 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 um, the 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 phases of grief. Mm. I mean, if you really take in that federal troops are going to Chicago, I've not heard this. Will you tell me what's happening? Well, uh, you know what's been happening in Portland, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, now the president considers it a great success. And he's like, it's like the rollout of a travel tour. And now they're about to go into Chicago. So I'm going to say to you something you might want to think about. It was problematical in a mainly white city of Portland. Can we think for a moment what's going to happen when you go into Chicago and you contribute to that? You add to that all the racial tensions there. Now, it is so huge, Maria, what's happening in this country that you almost can't take it in. And it, it's like it's like somebody giving you a cake and saying, eat the whole thing. You have to take it in bite-sized pieces. It's so overwhelming. I can't even it's so overwhelming. It's so overwhelming. And, and what is really healthy is that you're emotional about it. Because we're the adult generation. There, there, there isn't no mommy and daddy. It, it, it's up to us now. Yeah. Now, the good news is that both on the left side and the right side of the political spectrum of the United States, I do believe that the vast majority of Americans are good, decent people, uh, you know, high minded conservatives, high minded liberals. I do believe that. But people on serious uh, with attitudes that are really undermining of American democracy are now doing things that all people of goodwill, decency, and love of our country must stand up to. Just as other generations, I don't think people during the Civil War were happy to be having to deal with the Civil War. People during World War II were not happy to be having to deal with World War II. The women suffragettes were not happy to have to deal with what they had to deal with. The generation that fought the civil rights and desegregated the American South, were not happy to have to do it, but it was the challenge of their time. If you and I were told that the people close to us were in trouble, there's no question but that we would show up, we would rise to the occasion. And now we have to look at it the same way in terms of our collective experience. Would we have to cry at times? Yes, we would, and yes, we do. That's part of being human and getting to the point where we will have the clarity and the inspiration and the motivation and the strength to do whatever it is that we are guided to do to fix this. I've not heard one person explain that and say that, right? Like you just get overwhelmed because we've all been living this fabulous Instagram life for so long, right? If you think about like the start of social media, 2008, right? With Twitter, Facebook, I think preceded it, but you know, you start to think of, you know, the last at least 12 years. Um, but la- the last 20 years, it's just like everything was, you know. But let's think about that because even before the pandemic, 40% of all Americans could not afford 
an unexpected $400 expenditure. I assure you they were not living a fabulous Instagram life. Yeah. So yeah. there's a small pocket of us who have. So when you say we have all, no, within our silo. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, and I know that obviously we had the collapse in 2008 and stuff, but I just feel like in kind of the bigger cities, you know, and definitely in, in my space in the entertainment world, um, it's it's been a different thing. And so when you see everything, I mean, coronavirus, like we can't even, we, there's no end in sight and you're just, how is life going to resume? But you're right. Like, everybody's had their time and everyone's had their things to tackle. Not only that, but to realize how many millions of Americans were in economic lockdown even before coronavirus. Yeah. Yep. And the very fact that our country has reacted to the coronavirus so horribly. I mean, it did not originate here. But unlike other countries, the way our government has dealt with it, has been beyond inept. In my mind, it's been somewhat criminal. We had uh, ways and very intelligent people in our government who knew what to do to handle this more effectively. We, there were people who chose not to. And then even once bailouts started, uh, the bailout money mainly went to a small portion of huge corporate interests as opposed to people. Do you realize how many millions of people, Maria, for whom a $1,200 one-time bailout Twelve hundred dollars. I mean, just allow yourself to think about what that means. And that was given weeks and weeks ago in other countries. Let's say England. They gave direct cash to people at 80 percent of their salary so that they could make it through this in Vietnam. Countries like Vietnam, for goodness sakes, they have ATM machine type machines on the streets dispensing free rice. Here, we had 40 million uh, Americans living in hunger even before this happened. We have even in Florida where you are, there, you see lines of people in, in, in lines for hours waiting for a 30, uh, $30 food coupon. And, and our looking away from this is very dysfunctional. You know, some people will say, if you look at something that makes it expand. But that's a, a platitude we need to drop. Sometimes, sometimes things expand because you do not look at them. If you mm -hmm. have stage one cancer, the doctor doesn't say, well, it's only stage one. Let's just not look at it. Let's just not think about it. No, 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 no. You look at it when it's stage one so it doesn't become a stage four. So now, are we intelligent enough to handle all this? Are we as good as any other generation? Absolutely, we are. But we must put our attention on things that must be tended to. And when you begin to do that, you cry. You know, there, there was a book that came out years ago, a woman I think was about breast cancer. I think the title of the book was First You Cry. Mm. I mean, we have had the blessing of the most extraordinary freedoms in this country. We just took them for granted, Maria. Yeah. And so many of us, you know, if you make it into the club in America, You've made it into the club, and I've made it into the club. If you're in the club in America, there's no better place to be. Not enough people can make it into the club right now. That's the problem. Not that some people get to have fabulous lives, but that not enough people now, with healthcare, with education, with opportunity, financial and cultural, are able to reasonably be considered able to manifest their dreams. And what this has turned into as a consequence is rampant sociopathology, mass incarceration, et cetera. We've, we've got some serious things to think about. And I believe that the American woman has a serious role to play in doing that thinking, honoring our feelings and helping to bring forth some solutions. So I'm not the only one that's sad. I'm not the only one that's crying. How, um, and obviously it's the name of your book. So how do we turn our tears into triumph? Well, I believe that there is a divine intelligence in this world. I'm a woman of faith. I believe that if you look at the physical body, it's amazing how, how much the um, physical body, how much it can take in terms of injury 
and assault and sickness and still heal. And I believe that's true of the psyche and I believe it's true of civilization. I believe that now, as so many of us are awakening, we're going, wait, what's going on here? And we are showing up. I believe, you know, there's a, uh, there's a line, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Whether you call it the natural intelligence of the universe or you call it the will of God. I believe there is something that is an impulse in the direction of healing and wholeness. And I believe in atonement, just as the Catholics have in confession, the Jews have on the day of Yom Kippur. In Alcoholics Anonymous, people have to admit the exact nature of their character defects. I think it's time for all of us to say, wow, maybe I haven't lived my life quite thinking about some of the things I needed to think about. I atone for any place where I have not been as conscious as I might have been. And, and, and for me, the spiritual dimension is to surrender our lives to the forces of love, to the job at hand. And then it's amazing what begins to happen. You were taught, you, you said at the beginning of this interview that you're in Florida. And then a few minutes later, we were talking about the fact that the governor wants to open the schools, but there's a, a, a suit being brought against him by mothers, teachers, et cetera. It is the natural order of things that you probably, at the end of this interview, it would just be reasonable to think you might say, you know, I'm, I'm going to Google that. Uh, I'm going to Google that. It would be the natural order of things that you might say to your husband at dinner tonight. You know, did you know, blah, blah, blah. Once you awaken, you know, I heard Oprah say one time, you heal one aha at a time. Once you stop walling yourself off because you're afraid to go there, Mm. You you go wow, I, I'm, or, or what Marianne said about Portland. Or, I think I'm going to Google. I think I'm going to get online and read about what's going on in Chicago, and then your psyche will take it from there, Maria. Your intelligence will take it from there. You, with your resources, I have no doubt, will take it from there. It's just we've got to stop looking away, and then hope is born of hopeful solutions. You feel hopeless when you're not part of the solution. Mm -hmm. um, it, they used to say when I was young, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And I know when I was a very young woman, my mother used to make fun of me. She told me, she would tell me I was the only poor philanthropist she'd ever met. Because <laughs> very big, I would send Danny Thomas uh, $16 a month to heal childhood leukemia. And I would send $10 a month to this hunger in Africa organization or whatever. And I remember when I was sending $16 a month to whatever that organization was to help children. Every time I saw an article about leukemia and children, I'd go, we're on it. I felt we're on I it. I love you. That's $16 amazing. We're on it. What and a great and, example. Yeah. I mean, I always felt like, oh no, we're on it. We're on it. I send ten dollars a month. We're on it. <laughs> and you know what the truth is? If enough people send ten dollars a month, we are on it. Yeah. I don't think we're any of us are being called to radically change our lives. We're being called to just open our minds. And you, Maria, are such an example. So, so everybody watching your your program, we're not. I think a lot of people think, oh, I'd have to radically change my life. Actually, no, you wouldn't. It, you you're asked to think about things and in a way that actually will make you feel much, much better about yourself yeah. and about the world because you'll, you'll go to sleep at night knowing you're part of the solution. You're right. I think we look at things in such overwhelming ways, right? Like, how am I going to fix all of this? But if you think about like, you know, even, um, you know, I was telling someone yesterday that I've been on a judgment detox for the last two years. I really am trying hard not to judge people as much as possible because everybody's different and everybody's experience is different in life. And so, you know, even if you go from judging to non-judging, even if you go from not watching the news to paying attention so that you're aware, even if you're going from, you know, not donating anything to picking one organization that needs you right now so critically to giving $10 a month, like there's always something we can do. But when we look at it in the capacity of like, we need to make a massive change. We're not thinking about it as we're all 
connected in our even small. Exactly. Exactly. There are millions of other people. If you're upset about what's going on, just remember, there are millions of other people upset about it, too. We're a decent Mm -hmm. people. Americans are a decent people. You're not alone in in your upset. And also, I think some people have some strange ideas about not judging. You know, there's a difference between a judgment and a description. Do you think there would have been something holy about not, quote unquote, judging Hitler? Yeah. I I mean, at what point were people supposed to say, this is not okay? Yeah. You know, there are some uh, stories of what happened in Germany. And one that has always really uh, impacted me because of this topic is people who would say to, let's say, Mrs. Hoffman, do you know where Mrs. Schwartz is? Because I haven't seen the Schwartzes haven't come out of their house. Um, in a while, I haven't seen the Schwartz children playing. Do you, do you have you seen the Schwartz family? I haven't seen them recently. And the lady would say, "Oh, let's just think about positive things." That's how it happened, Maria. No way. I mean, I never would have thought about it like that. Sorry, no, we're having... way. Um, but people but were you're right. People were like, well, "Where did the Jews go?" Oh, let's just not think about that. Yeah. And I'm talking about not about people necessarily who would have consciously said, oh, let's get rid of the Jews. But people who, when it started happening, didn't have the moral fiber to stand up to it. And by the time enough had the moral fiber, and many continue to, don't get me wrong. But by the time enough began to, it was already a moment where they themselves were putting their lives at risk in order to do so. Yeah. There's still time, but all of us must stand up in the ways that our own internal guidance leads us to do. Wow. Wow. I mean, you know, you think about, um, I have to pay attention to the clock because I know you have um, a heart out. Um, You think about how many people are suffering with depression right now. You talk about depression as kind of a message that our souls are suffering, right? Will you expand on that a little bit for people? I I don't have a heart out actually. So let's. Oh, okay. How long you want? I just I just got the the message in here, so I was like, oh no, I have to make sure I get you out on time. Not not from my end, maybe from your end, but not from my end. Um, you were just asking me about depression. Okay, depression, we really have to look at that word because there are forms of no, within the purview of normal human despair. Uh, you got a divorce, your husband or wife di- uh, um, divorced you and you did not want the divorce. Of course you're depressed. Someone that you love died. Of course you're depressed. Your company went bankrupt. Of course you're depressed. Your child is addicted to heroin. Of course you're depressed. This is not a mental illness that you're depressed. And these days, what has happened is that there has been an appropriation of the word. People say, oh, no, 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 no. Clinical depression is something different. Now, I am not, contrary to how some people have described me, I'm not in any way uh, opposed to psychotherapeutic drugs. There are people with bipolar bipolar conditions, schizophrenia, et cetera, who obviously are helped by psychotherapeutic drugs. Mm -hmm. But we have gotten to a point, particularly among American women, where any sign of depression is seen as something that's a serious problem that should be treated by psychotherapeutic drugs, even when there are very serious things to think about. Number one, uh, for it is it is a black box uh, uh, warning on those drugs that um, uh, that people 25 years old and younger who take the antidepressants uh, can have a greater risk rather than lesser risk of suicidal ideation. Uh, the 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 use of antidepressants at the rate we have them have not in fact brought uh, suicide rates down. They are now recognized as being very addictive. And so while I do believe there's such a thing as clinical depression where perhaps they would be useful, 
you want to, I look at it much like pain pills. Is there a reason for painkillers? Absolutely there is. For people who, or people who have serious, serious pain, of course there's a reason for narcotics. Mm-hmm. But what happened was that our attorneys general are now all over the country indicting and prosecuting uh, pharmaceutical company executives for known predatory actions where which caused the opioid crisis. So antidepressants should be the same thing. They should be seen as something to be taken by those who are who are there is some reason to seriously believe seriously need them. And my point is that might not be the kinds of things we talked about, which are simply normal human despair. Many people will say, oh, it's a chemical imbalance. But I don't know. I know very few people, if any. Actually, I don't know anyone who was put on antidepressants who went to have a brain chemistry test first. In fact, many women are given them by their gynecologist. That's hardly a mental health expert. So I think that the fact that we are depressed about what's going on in many things in America today is actually, as I said, a functional rather than a dysfunctional response to our time. And telling us that it's a dysfunctional response will will lead us into behavior that either causes us to desensitize ourselves from it or go down a deep spiral. Um, I think people such as ourselves should be holding each other's hands and supporting each other, knowing that other generations went through tough times. Surely you think that the people who walked across the bridge at Selma, you think they weren't anxious? You think that the women suffragettes who, when they were thrown in jail for marching for the a right of a woman to vote, the and chills. the conditions in the jail were so terrible that they went on a hunger strike. And the response of the prison administration was to send men into their cells to put these metal contraptions around their neck to force them to eat. You think they weren't upset and anxious? But if they had not gone through that, you and I would not be, would we be voting today? Other generations were anxious, but they still rose to the occasion. Right now, you and I have to be anxious you and I have to be depressed at times. You and I have to cry. When you had tears in your eyes a few minutes ago, that was a functional response to what has occurred. And we will get out of our anxiety, into our inspiration, into our motivation when we stand up and say, you know what? This country has some problems and we're going to fix it. We're going to make it through COVID. We're going to do it for the sake of our children. We're going to do it for the sake of our children. We're going to fix our economy. We're going to fix what's happening. We're going to do it. And we're all on the other side of this going to be better people because we showed up. We're going to be stronger men and women, and we're going to be a better country. I believe that with all my heart. I think that's just such an incredible message. And I know that you just helped me tremendously. Um, And I think that um, you have helped so many people that are listening right now because, yeah, we definitely, um, we're definitely in a challenging time. Yes, and we should admit that we're in a challenging time and not pretend we're not in a challenging time. Yeah, and I think that, you know, everyone's just waiting for Santa to show up. And exactly. and <laughs> Santa's that's, not that's, coming, guys. That is it's so, us. You're exactly right. It, we've had a crisis of adulthood. We, we didn't quite, we didn't have the kind of coming of age experience that like my parents' generation had with World War II. And so too many women are still psychologically grounded in the space of a little girl. Too many men are still psychologically grounded in the space of a little boy. So this is a coming of age event We're all growing up and maturing very quickly. But once again, Maria, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. We're going to be better on the other side of this. I believe this. Yeah. I think uh, you've clarified so many things, but also like you're giving us our hope back. That's where hope comes from. Hope, faith in God means faith in God in us. Hope comes from knowing we're going to handle this. (laughs) Yeah. It's not somebody else is going to handle this. It's yes. Place. That's what I think all of us are thinking like, Hey, Hey, who's going to handle this for us? Cause uh, I don't think I can, I'm not equipped. I don't know what to do. Like everybody's kind of just waiting. Like I said, for Santa, when we have to realize you're right, like whatever we can do, we should do. 
particularly we have elections coming up soon. Uh, there's a lot we can do. There's so much we can do. And I, I, because I'm a woman with a spiritual orientation, I believe that if we pray, and for those who don't see it that way, look into your internal guidance, whatever, and ask, it's amazing how much we know in our hearts we could do, but we just haven't been looking there. Yeah. You know, I can't let you go without asking you about the presidential election coming up in November. It was interesting when you were on the show before, you were like moments from announcing. And I felt it that day. Um, what do you think about the, um, you know, the, the state of the election right now? Kanye West has um, jumped into the race. Tell me what you're thinking. I'm definitely going to be voting for Joe Biden. Um, Joe Biden is not a conservative's dream candidate and he's not a liberal's dream candidate, but he is the dream candidate of the part of us as Americans, which knows we must get back to some normalcy. We, we must get back to some decency. We must get back to some basic respect for the pillars of democracy. The, Issues of left versus right, we'll deal with all of that later, but we can't deal with it until we get back to some basic decency. We need to get back on the track of the ba of basic respect for the traditions of American democracy. And that to me is sacrosanct. In my opinion, you cannot have that with this president. And that's why I will not only be voting for uh, Joe Biden, uh, but hoping passionately that he wins. Um, we're way past the period of, oh, but I don't agree with him about this, or I don't agree with him about that. Who cares <laughs> right now? Because the issues that we normally think of as the issues, we need to deal with the underlying issues of the fact that the current president we have, his attorney general, his Department of Homeland Security, and others are displaying a, a lack of respect for our Constitution and um, sometimes they say, I don't want to vote for the lesser of two evils. If your two choices are evil, you better believe you should vote for the lesser. Wow. What did you think of Kanye joining the race? Do you, are you taking that seriously? Well, I think that we should, first of all, I have to say as someone who ran myself, he has a right to run if he wants to run. Uh, where I am sitting right now, um, I do not feel that we have the luxury of anything that takes away from the effort to replace the Trump presidency in November. Got it. Um, Marianne, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marianne. We really needed this. It's always so lovely to talk to you. And, thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you for all you have and all you do. Much love to you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I can't tell you how much I needed this. <laughs> so I think if I needed this, I'm sure there are many others like me who needed it too. So thank you for giving me hope. God bless you, honey. God bless you. We'll see you soon. You too. Wow. So, so unbelievable. I'm bringing Kelsey back in the room now. I mean, you guys know, like, you know, um, you go into interviews and you just don't know where you're going to go. And I or at least for me, that's what I do. I just kind of follow the conversation. I had no idea she was going to share that with us or that that's kind of where we were going. And, you know, everything for me, I feel like I get what I need when I need it. Right. Like yeah. that's what I needed to hear today. And I just love that. Like she was the poorest philanthropist ever. I think that's so amazing. Cause she was like, yep, yeah, I got this. And she's right. When you are invested in the solution, you can't be hopeless because you're like, you're moving the ball forward. A hundred percent. She came in with fire today. I love Mary Williamson, did. but you know, to prep for this segment, I watched her last appearance on your show and she's always eloquent, but, um, you know, she was a little more subdued, a little more, and she came in with fire and passion today. Cause she knows mm -hmm. it is an urgent, urgent time for us right now. Yeah. It was really she came amazing. in with fire from the beginning too. That's what I liked. It yeah. was like, 
She didn't even stutter once. I, oof, she gives me chills. I love I her. I think she gave us so many breakthroughs. Like I think um, on the anxiety end, on the what are we doing end, on the fact that, you know, other generations have had their struggles they've had to get through. And like, why are we going to be kind of the spoiled brats who gets a skirt by without it? Like we've yep. got to get up and figure this out. Um, yep. Uh, full disclosure, I drink a lot of water and I've got to use the ladies' room. So <laughs> I'm going to end this right now. Um, full but, disclosure, I hope you almost saw me eat it, Maria, when I slipped on the stair to bring you that time. Is that what happened? All of a sudden I heard some <laughs> or something behind me because she's like, hard out, hard out. <laughs> oh. so Thank you guys for joining us. If you're new to the show, um, normally I'm in a studio, but for the next week or so, I won't be for my own uh, mental health, but um, I'm going to get some trees. Actually, we're going to get to our studio in a couple of days. By next week, we'll be in our studio, so you guys will see us there. But thank you for joining us. And, um, you know, if you um, enjoyed this interview, um, we have many more in our library, all kinds of healers and doctors and spiritual guiders and all kinds of things. So you can deep dive into the library, but also uh, if you want more on Marianne Williamson, you can check out her newest book, A Politics of Love. It's available wherever books are sold. Her nonprofit project, Angel Food, has been doing amazing work since COVID started. So you can support that. Maybe that's your contribution that you'll start. Maybe it's $5. Maybe it's $1. Maybe it's 50 cents. Everything ends up. Go to angelfood.org um, and you can follow her at Marianne Williamson. We'll put the um, links to all this in the summary. You can follow us at Maria Menunos, at Jeffrey Crane Graham, at Kelsmeyer too. And remember, be nice people, make good choices, and be present.